Hello everybody, my name is Garvin and I read things and chatter about them on the internet for your entertainment. So over the last two weeks we have looked at a collection of merfolk that were or are worshipped as divinities by various cultures and peoples. Today we're going to look at a deity who you're likely aware of if you're a fan of Lovecraftian horror, or if you play Dungeons and Dragons for example, I'm talking about Dagon who many of you probably think of as sort of the quintessential Lord of the Deeps or Inhuman Elder God or even Demon Lord of the Ocean. Although, there are just as likely many of you who think of him solely as the God of the Philistines from the Old Testament. Now, we are pretty sure he was one of the gods of the Philistines, but what if I told you he likely didn't have anything to do with the ocean and that pop culture's Dagon isn't really Lovecraft's fault? Let's start from the beginning. The earliest evidence we have of Dagon is from the Bronze Age. In western Syria, we find Akkadian monuments thanking Dagon for delivering the land into the hands of Sargon the Conqueror, who, as far as we know, is the first emperor in human history. The Akkadian monuments characterize Dagon as Lord of the Western Lands. Dagon isn't the only god they did this for. As the Akkadians expanded their empire and they conquered new places, they would often set up monuments to local gods, claiming that the local gods had delivered this land unto their rule. And that's a tactic that would be copied by later empires as well. Now, in other places in Syria, we have also discovered temples and cult sites that have named Dagon the father of Baal and a god of the earth. In fact, his name is usually brought up in regards to farming and grain, which is pretty far away from fish, isn't it? The Bronze Age Hittites equated him with their god, uh, Kumarbi. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I couldn't find a reliable guide. Kumarbi is a farming god. And when the Iron Age Greeks moved into the area, they believed him to be another name for or an aspect of Kronos, the father of Zeus. An interesting note here, the word Dagon in Ugaric one of the cultures of the area, actually just means grain. Another interesting note to this is Dagon is not a Canaanite god. Canaan is the area that we now call the Levant or Palestine, and the people there were the Canaanites in the Bible. And Dagon is not typically listed as one of their gods. And some of you might be asking, well, why does that even matter? The Philistines are on the south side of modern-day Israel or Palestine, uh, around the Gaza-Sinai area, which means that Canaan is between Syria, where Dagon starts, and where the Philistines are, and there's no evidence of Dagon having traveled through that area. I, as an idea, I mean. Now... The Philistines are currently believed to be a resettled sea people group who attacked Egypt, lost, and were set up in the Gaza area as a buffer state between Egypt and all those angry hill people up north. Uh, DNA evidence, along with some pottery artifacts, has shown a connection to southern Europe and Greece. So, why would people who started up in Greece and possibly the Balkans and Cyprus and Crete who came to Egypt and got resettled on their border be worshipping a Syrian god. Well, I looked into it and this turns out to be a subject of intense debate. The current understanding, as far as I can parse it, and keep in mind I'm not claiming to be an expert here, I'm an enthusiastic amateur, but I am leaving you my sources in the description, is that the Philistines either adopted Dagon from the Syrians who joined them, or they ran into the god when they were in Syria and adopted him, as sometimes people do. I mean, for example, my ancestors were not always Christians, 
we adopted the Christian God. So kind of the same thing here. Now at this point, the Old Testament becomes our main textual source for the worship of Dagon, although there is archaeology to back this up. So we do have physical evidence that the Philistines worshiped Dagon. Now, while I'm a practicing Christian, I'll admit that using the Old Testament as a source to figure out details about the Philistine religion is a losing game at best and just really a terrible idea. First of all, because that's not really something the Israelite authors were concerned about. They were writing about their own history and beliefs, and Dagon and the Philistines only mattered to them so far as that the Philistines were their enemies and Dagon was something they were worshipping. Second, while the Old Testament is a cornerstone of my faith, it was written by men who were biased, who had their own agendas, and were honestly creating something to bring their own people together while explaining their enemies were bad. This is without even getting into the massive issues of translations from the Hebrew Torah into the Christian Testament, the switch up in languages, and the sheer amount of time that has passed. So this is an example of why you have to be aware of the biases and agendas of your sources when you do research. Now, that said, we are going to talk about the Old Testament stories here because they were very instrumental in shaping how our culture sees Dagon. While Dagon's temples are mentioned several times in the Old Testament and the Torah, there's really only two main stories. The first is the death of Samson, where he topples the temple of Dagon while being inside it, killing thousands of Philistines. I'm not going to go into detail on that story because Dagon doesn't really figure into it. It's just something that kind of happens in a big temple of Dagon and doesn't really tell us much. Now, the second one is one I'm going to read directly to you, but first I'm going to give you some context here. This story takes place before the rule of kings in Israel. At this time, the Israelites are a loose confederation of tribes and clans who are sporadically united by the rule of religious figures called judges. This takes place early in the career of Samuel, who is basically the last ruling judge of Israel or the first prophet of Israel, depending how you parse this. And this takes place while he's a young man. To boil down the setup, basically the Israelites were losing a war against the Philistines and they decided to bring out the Ark of the Covenant to try and basically force a victory. And it doesn't work. They lose the battle, it's considered a huge disaster because they lose a lot of men, but they also lost the Ark of the Covenant, which is the single holiest item in Israel. And in the Bible itself, this is pitched as the reason this happened was not only were the Israelites kind of sinful at the time, but they were trying to force God to aid him, basically twist his arm into doing so in a rather disrespectful way, and he didn't take kindly to that. There's a lot of details here that's not going to matter to most of you. Basically, the Philistines have seized through combat the holiest object of Israel, uh, and here's what happens next. Okay, just for the record, I'm going to be reading this from the first book of Samuel, chapter 5, starting with verse 1. I will be using the New International Version translation because on a scholarly level, that is honestly the better translation. Plus, it's written in a modern vernacular, so I imagine it's going to be easier for everyone to read. That said, to be honest with you, I grew up with the King James Bible, and while I accept that it's not as good a translation on a scholarly level. I do think it's slightly more interesting to read. So if you would prefer if I use the King James Version it someday, just let me know in the comments. But let's get started. 1 Samuel chapter 5. After the Philistine had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. 
Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it besides Dagon. Just as an aside, this would have been an idol of Dagon that was used to represent him. When the people of Ashdad rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning they rose, and there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priest of Dagon or any other who enters Dagon's temple at Ashdad step on the threshold. So just to give you some context, in Mesopotamia and a lot of places in what would be the modern day Middle East, temples tended to have idols in them that weren't considered the literal god per se from what I understand, but a representation of of the god that temple was uh, devoted to. And they would, uh, you know, do all sorts of things with these idols. You know, they would put clothes on them. They would bathe them and perfume them. They would offer meals to this idol as a representation of them devoting these resources to the god or goddess in question. So, you walk in and you find the representation of your god basically face first, which is a motion of supplication to the god of your enemy. It's a disturbing moment. Uh, I did some research here and beheading uh, was, you know, no surprise, a common execution in the area. And uh, so... The implication here is that, uh, you know, God has executed Dagon in his own house for a lack of respect. Which, if you were a Philistine, that must have been terrifying. Continuing from verse 6, chapter 5. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. And rats appeared in their land, and there was death and destruction throughout the city. When the people of Ashdad saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay with us, for his hand is heavy on us, and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the Ark of the God of Israel. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of that city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. As the Ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought the ark of the God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. Now, just for context, I am going to go ahead and tell you how this story ends. Uh, I'm not going to read any further directly from the Bible. Just, that was uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. And you can find more just by typing that into Google. There'll be direct uh, websites where you can read it. The Philistines did return the Ark of the Israelites, and has an apology to the Almighty, they included five golden tumors and five golden rats. And that must have been something to see. Just imagine you're standing on the side of the road, and here comes this ox-drawn cart with the Ark of the Covenant on it, and just all, right next to it are these little golden tumors and little golden rat statues, I would have been like, I don't know what happened here, but it must have been something. 
this is the main story that a lot of Western civilization would come to know of Dagon, though. So you might be asking, where does the fish come from? Well, in the 4th century AD, some scholars begin to equate Dagon with fish because the Hebrew word dag, again, I'm not an expert, but this is what I get out of the sources, means fish. Which is interesting, but remember that Dagon isn't from this area, so the Hebrew word has nothing to do with the origin of the name Dagon. It's kind of like how Ohio in Japanese means hello, but in English it means a state of the United States. It's a result of humanity only being able to make so many sounds, as far as I can tell. By the 11th century, even Jewish commentators were buying into this, and the 13th century rabbi David uh, Remibi suggested that Dagon had a traditional merfolk setup of a human body and a fish lower body joined together. So you might be jumping ahead to Lovecraft's work now and saying, okay, that's the whole chain of events there. Pop culture thinks of Dagon as a fish god because of Lovecraft, and he thought that because of mistranslation in the Middle Ages by scholars who didn't have all the evidence. Well, there's a missing link we need to talk about, and it's Milton. John Milton. Now, some of you are likely asking, who is that? And no shame if you are, because at least when I was in high school, they no longer really talked about who John Milton was. So, let me do a quick thumbnail sketch, but this is an interesting dude with a rather complex uh, life, so I would really need to do a whole video for him to get, you know, justice. So, this is going to be really quick and dirty, and we're going to be missing a lot of nuance. Bear with me. John Milton was an English writer who lived from 1608 to 1674. He was a huge proponent of republicanism and supported parliament in the English Civil War. He would also support Cromwell's government while calling on Cromwell to support more liberal forms of government because Oliver Cromwell was basically a military dictator. Even after Cromwell died and the monarchy was restored, Milton was quietly open about wanting a republican form of government in England. Now, what I mean by that is he basically wanted an elected government with no king. He was anti-monarchist. I couldn't find anything if he backed uh, Cromwell's more radical policies like banning Christmas, which is one of the reasons why Cromwell was unpopular, to put it mildly. I mean... After they restored the monarchy, they dug his corpse up and beheaded it out of spite. So, you can kind of figure how the average English person thought of him at that point. But getting back to Milton, I am going to say what I could find of his religious views is they're pretty unique. And not really relevant to this video other than the fact that he was Christian and he was all in on Christianity being the one true path. It's been a hot minute or three since I've been in school, and I'm not going to claim I know what schools teach these days, but when I was in school, Milton was not favored by our English teachers. Uh, he was glossed over or just outright skipped, but there were times in our history where John Milton was considered an equal or superior to Shakespeare as a poet and writer. And having looked into some of his work, I can see why. To give you some examples, Milton gave us the phrases outer space and all hell broke loose. He invented the word pandemonium. His most well-known work and likely the one most people would consider his masterpiece is Paradise Lost, a massive blank verse poem about the creation of the universe the rebellion of Satan against God, and the fall of humanity into a state of sin. So, we right away see here that John Milton does not think small. And, to be honest, folks, if you're from an English-speaking country, your conception of 
those stories likely has as much to do with Milton's work as it does with anything that's actually in the Bible. So John Milton had a massive impact on popular theology and our views of these stories. In Paradise Lost, Milton names and describes a number of fallen angels who serve Satan and set themselves up as false gods to mislead humanity and lure them into hell. Dagon is one of those fallen angels, and he's described as taking on the form of a merman. In fact, Milton also gives chaos and the void a voice and characterization in the poem, and this would inspire a lot of Lovecraft's work, but those are topics for another video, I think. Now, I don't want to go too deep into this sinkhole, but I do feel like I also have to give some context here for Lovecraft. Uh, he was raised in a large part by his grandparents because his father died when he was very young and his mother was not well. In, in fact, she would be committed into an asylum. I'm not going to go into too many details because that's a whole video in of itself. He was brought up in one of those periods where Milton was held up as one of the greatest English writers. And Lovecraft himself was very vocal about his admiration for John Milton's work. So it's no surprise that in Lovecraft's short story Dagon, there are open references to Milton's work. And Father Dagon of the Deep Ones of Innsmouth, for example, and other stories, owes a lot to Milton. So why do we think of Dagon as a fish god? My stance is it's not Lovecraft, it was Milton who did this. And because of a poem of an unrepentant English Republican, we now have Dagon in video games, movies, Dungeons and Dragons, and other games, has this expression of the terror of the deep and the creatures that live within it and just how alien it is to our experiences and this is a this is a pretty good impact for a man who died almost 400 years ago so let's let's give our respect to john milton there i think this is a good note to end this video on and i hope you found it informative or at least entertaining if so Please leave a like or comment or consider subscribing. All of those help me in my total struggle against the Dread Lord algorithm. Terror be on his name. Special thanks to Big Steve, my biggest supporter. Could not do this without your support, man. You can join up with Steve and other of my Patreons in the link below. Uh, for as little as a dollar a month, you get a vote in upcoming content. If you just want to do a one-time donation, I do have a coffee site listed there as well. Uh, I have linked my sources below for today's video, because I will always try to leave my sources where you guys can look at them for yourselves, and I encourage you to do so. Next week, we're looking at the merfolk of the ancient and classical world, and I hope you join me for that. Until then, though, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and of course, keep reading!